Welcome to Discovering You, a podcast that explores the intricacies of personality and how it impacts the way we navigate through life. What will you discover today? Hi, listeners. Hi, Heather. Hi. Today, I'm going to be discussing grit and how it manifests in our behaviors, our goals, and our achievements. Before I get to that, though, here's this month's DISC correlation. In keeping with the summer theme, last time I compared DISC to ice cream, I'm doing DISC according to type of vacation. So for high D, this is the category of adventure and thrill-seeking. Could be a mountain climb or whitewater rafting or hella skiing. High risk, high reward. For high I, an all-inclusive tropical vacation with lots of opportunities to socialize and party with like-minded eyes. For high S, a retreat or a spa to relax, reflect, and rejuvenate. High C would be a guided tour of historical sites or museums or galleries, informative, educational, organized. Back to today's topic, grit. How is it defined? Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines it as a firmness of mind or spirit. Angela Duckworth has a lot more to add to that definition. Angela has studied grit in depth, and she's the author of Grit, The Power of Passion and Perseverance. She has a PhD in psychology, is a MacArthur Fellow, and a professor at the University of Pennsylvania. MacArthur is a prize awarded each year to about 20 or 30 individuals who have shown extraordinary originality and dedication in their creative pursuits and a marked capacity for self-direction. The MacArthur is often referred to as the genius grant, which is pretty ironic in Angela's case. The irony is that she opens her book by sharing a story of her father, who often told her, you know, you're no genius. (laughs) I think the MacArthur people would disagree. Angela's work on grit focuses not on natural ability, which I think is often what genius is attributed to, but on the role that hard work, dedication, and tenacity play in success. One of the famous examples Angela shares in her book is Charles Darwin. It may surprise you to know that Darwin believed that people didn't vary that much in intelligence, but in quote, zeal and hard work. Even more interesting is that Darwin's biographers feel that way about him. They don't believe he possessed supernatural intelligence, but described him more as a plotter. When you think of Darwin and how he's been regarded, certainly what he's accomplished, I think this is very telling. When defining grit, Duckworth describes it as passion and perseverance for long-term goals. And when she elaborates, she says it's easier to comment on what grit isn't. It isn't talent, luck, or how intensely in the moment you want something. It's about having a focus or a goal that you care so much about that it organizes and gives meaning to almost everything you do. She goes on to say that grit is holding steadfast to that goal when challenges arise, disruptions get in the way, or even when mistakes are made. Even if you feel that you're progressing at a snail's pace, you'll still stay moving in that direction. Listeners, you may be wondering if there is a way to find out how much grit you have. Angela Duckworth created and developed what she calls the grit scale to help you measure your level of grittiness. And I really like how she describes her scale. She qualifies it first by saying it's not perfect or without flaws, but it's a helpful prompt for self-reflection and a great tool for coaches and teachers when guiding and motivating others. So with that in mind, let's dive in and check out the scale. We love our questionnaires, quizzes, assessments on this podcast, don't we? (laughs) We'll also include a link to the grit scale in the show notes. You'll need to check that out if you want to score yourself as the scale changes for each answer. But to give you an idea of what it's about, here are the questions. One, new ideas and projects sometimes distract me from previous ones. Your options for answering are not at all like me, not much like me, somewhat like me, mostly like me, very much like me. Number two, 
Setbacks don't discourage me. I don't give up easily. Three, I often set a goal, but later choose to pursue a different one. Four, I'm a hard worker. Five, I have difficulty maintaining my focus on projects that take more than a few months to complete. Six, I finish whatever I begin. Seven, my interests change from year to year. Eight, I am diligent. I never give up. Nine, I have been obsessed with a certain idea or project for a short time, but later lost interest. And finally, number 10, I have overcome setbacks to conquer an important challenge. Again, it helps to have a visual, so I recommend checking that out. Uh, Heather and I both did ours. (laughs) (laughs) And I'm curious, Heather, if you want to share your score and I guess what you thought of your results. Yeah, I absolutely want to share my score. So I did do it and my score was a four. Mm -hmm. And I'll be honest, in true wanting to get a high score fashion was like, (laughs) oh, I thought I was grittier than that. Mm -hmm. Like I thought I was gritty. And you are. I can identify with that. You are gritty because I think when it comes up to that, what does it say? With that score, you're, it says grittier than 70% of the population, right? Uh, to be honest, I didn't look. I think that's what it says. Mine is pretty similar. So mine is 4.1, pretty close together. It's interesting though how, well, I love that you know you wanted you to have the perfect score. <laughs> and I think that's kind of on brand for you. But One of the things that I wanted to talk about, and remember Angela qualifies this herself, and I think that's important. I think the way that we answer things can vary greatly. And I know this from working with you, Heather, (laughs) is that I think you're probably harder on yourself than maybe other people would. So I think that even Mm. when scoring it, I can see you being more conservative on the estimate, right? So instead of hitting... Uh, I hadn't thought of that. Yeah. The reason this occurs to me is, you know, I do EQ training with people and this also plays a large role when you have an assessment that is self-directed. So it's asking you, right? A piece like self-awareness comes in, but people who tend to work to very high standards. So guess what? High C for you. I have a high C too. They tend to not maybe see things the same way that somebody, let's say, who's a high I, who's very optimistic. And it's like, yeah, sure. That's me. I'm guessing that maybe in some of the ones where maybe it should have been very much like me, you might have just been modest and picked mostly like me. Oh, that's good perspective. I hadn't thought of that. I was pretty disappointed in myself. (laughs) But that's still a really, that's a pretty gritty score, Heather. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It is. To gain an even deeper understanding than that score, you can break your score into separate passion and perseverance scores because as Angela says, they are not the same thing. If you score high on passion, you'll likely score high on perseverance and vice versa. Interestingly, she says that most people with high grit scores have higher perseverance scores than passion. This would indicate that it's not just the intense feeling and drive that you have for something that matters, but it's the ability to keep at it day after day, long term. Consistency and routine may not sound or feel like inspiration or passion, but they are the perseverance piece that's vital to grit. Heather, I think maybe this is going to resonate with you more. How does this play out for you with your passion and perseverance score? Yeah, so this made a lot more sense for me when we broke it down. Mm -hmm. So my passion score is three, but my perseverance score is five. And so that I can identify with 100%. Consider myself a hard worker and nothing gets in the way of getting things done. I will persevere through anything. Yep. I feel like passion is... I don't have one thing that I'm passionate about, but I am interested in a lot of things. Interesting. And I can attest to that, to your work ethic and getting (laughs) stuff done and just keeping at it. Interestingly for me, not really sure what this says about me, everyone, but my passion score is higher. I still have high on both, but I can see where the passion piece would be more for me in terms of my business. Even, you know, with this podcast, I always bring everything back to disc, right? I relate it to disc. And I think that is probably that passionate focus. I'm just keeping that alive. That fire is burning. I want to share that with as many people as possible. So I think that's where where it plays out for me. It's not a right or wrong, right? Yeah. And again, correct me if I'm wrong about this part, but if disc 
is you have different factors that make a good team Mm -hmm. or make a complete team. Yes. Is that the same for us if we're slightly different in the grit, but high? Yes. A project gets done and gets done well and passionately and quickly and all the things. Absolutely. That's a really good analogy. And that's completely right. Okay. Research shows us the psychological assets that highly gritty people have in common. There are four. One is interest. This connects to the passion part of grit. If you truly enjoy what you do, this is the spark that ignites your purpose. No one loves every aspect of their work, but if you feel excitement, inspiration with the overall idea, this helps drive you through the less enjoyable parts of it. Number two is practice. Now we're looking at the perseverance part. After you've honed in on what interests you, in order to be successful at it, you've got to practice and develop and improve your skills. Think of someone who loves a violin. It's not enough to feel that way, but it's the countless hours of practicing the music over and over to master it. And speaking of practice, it's deliberate practice. So I wasn't familiar with this distinction prior to reading Grit, but now that I understand it, it totally makes sense. It's the intentional part of practice that matters, not just mindless repetition. So deliberate practice involves a clearly defined stretch goal, full concentration and effort, immediate and informative feedback, repetition with reflection and refinement. Duckworth estimates that most of us don't do any deliberate practice. Even super achieving, highly driven people may not be doing it. She tells a story in the book about an Olympic coach who was called in to consult on a rowing team that wasn't winning despite practicing longer hours than most teams. He undoubtedly surprised them by advising them to spend less overall hours, but more thoughtful hours. He told them it wasn't about hours of brute force exhaustion, but rather the pursuit of high quality, contemplative training goals. Number three is purpose. This is about considering your passion and putting it into the perspective of how it matters. For most people, it's hard to sustain passion for a long period of time without purpose. In order to achieve this, most people identify their work as both personally interesting, but also connected to a greater sense of being relevant or helpful to others. This one really resonates with me because I'm endlessly fascinated by the analysis of behavior, but it's not enough for me to find it personally interesting. I feel the need to share the information and strategies because I truly feel it will be helpful for others too. And finally, we have hope. This is what perseveres when you encounter setbacks and doubts arise. It gives you the ability to get up when you've been knocked down and keep on going. As Angela says, if we stay down, grit loses. If we get up, grit prevails. When she interviewed Bill Gates, he reminisced about back in the day when he was hiring software programmers at Microsoft. He gave them a programming task that he knew would require hours of focused and sometimes tedious work. He wasn't interested in an IQ test. This task was a test of a person's ability to keep going through challenges until they made it to the finish line. He only hired programmers that could finish what they began. Angela also includes a conversation she had with the Dean of Admissions at Harvard. She wanted to know what, if any, other factors besides marks contributed to being accepted to such a prestigious school. Several hundred students are admitted every year on the merits of their marks, so high academics, absolutely. But what may interest you is they admit just as many who have made a commitment to pursue something they feel passionate about and have put their energy and hard work into. For instance, if the student was committed to athletics but gets injured or doesn't make the team, they have found that all the energy and drive and grit that was developed through athletics can be transferred to something else. Knowing that the student has that capacity is what convinces Harvard that they will succeed in their academic career, even if their marks aren't as high as the others. Here I go. I warned you about this. You know I got to relate everything to DISC. Which DISC factor do you think has the most grit? Heather, I don't know if you want to take a stab at it or not. Listeners, you can think too. There was a clue in how Angela describes it, which I mentioned earlier, and you may have picked up on holding steadfast to a goal. Any guesses? I don't know. I want to say D. I know you do. 
Well, guess what? I do think there's one that represents it more than others, but I'm going to delineate how each disc factor demonstrates grit because you know what? They all do. So D, here's how grit shows up for D. In their ability to set goals and focus their energy on zoning in on them directly, looking at the end result and not being distracted by objections or details that could get in the way. I feel like questions two and 10 on the grit scale remind me of D, which is about overcoming setbacks and conquering a challenge. I is the passion piece of grit. Eyes are fueled by emotions, including feelings of inspiration, and this propels them to move forward. It's also the optimism to believe that stretch goals are possible. S's are known to be incredibly tenacious. Another way to say this is stubborn. When I think of grit, this is actually the first factor that pops into my mind. Question number eight makes me think of them. I am diligent. I never give up. (laughs) Very high S. And then C shows up in the practice part of grit. If you think of the example I used with mastering the ability to play the violin, the amount of structure, discipline, and methodical behavior it takes is very high C, not to mention the desire to perfect a skill, which motivates C's. Okay, now I'd like to share something on a personal note. While I was working on this episode, my grandmother, Nora, the very embodiment of grit, passed away. The timing of this was not lost on me, and I felt it to be more than coincidental. She had just celebrated her 100th birthday and was in great spirits at the party in her honor. So already you can see that she was in a unique category of being a centenarian. But let me paint a clearer picture. Nora raised five children, including my mom, as well as working outside of the home most of her life. She retired at the age of 90. You heard that right. If that isn't remarkable enough, let me tell you what the job she retired from was. She was a dance and phys ed teacher right up until 90. And until 88, she rode her bike to work. She was annoyed when she could no longer do that, but she had fallen and broken her wrist and was under strict instructions to stop traveling to work in that manner. In her younger years, she was a professional dancer and performed in a theater troupe. She went on to be a choreographer and eventually a teacher. During some of those years, she took on extra jobs, including working in a Cadbury's chocolate factory, to make ends meet. She weathered her share of hardships, including the losses of her husband, her youngest son, and her first grandchild. No matter how hard things got, she continued to put one foot in front of the other, and she persevered. She was a firm believer in exercise and would take several walks daily. She could still do a shoulder stand well into her 90s, and she could often be found demonstrating the perfect technique to execute a tap step. When music would come on, she had a hard time sitting still. She just had to bust a move. Even when her mobility became reduced, you would see her sitting in her chair, with her feet tapping away on the floorboards beneath. I feel very fortunate to have had such an incredible role model, and I have much gratitude that we had her in our lives for so many years. Nora Dixon, Nanny Nora to me, thank you for the inspiring example. You were grit personified. Well, she sounds amazing. Yeah, she really was. What a great tribute to your grandmother. Thank you for that. Now it's time for our listener question. What is the most common reason or reasons for hosting a facilitation and what is the optimal outcome? Okay, thanks for your question. The most common facilitations that I do are for team building. An opportunity for a team leader and team members to understand themselves and each other and how to maximize their combined strengths for cohesion and success. More often than not, they're done in the spirit of a fun, positive team building experience, but also with the mindfulness of strategic growth. I also do facilitations when either a team or even a couple of employees are encountering challenges, which are detrimental to the work or team environment. Using tools like DISC and EQ allows them to gain insights into different behavioral styles, and they often realize that they've been misunderstanding the motivations behind the behavior that they're seeing in others. We do exercises to build empathy for another point of view, and there are actionable takeaways to help stay on track. 
If you're interested in booking Victoria for a speaking engagement or team facilitation, contact her at discoverwhatworks.org. Thanks for listening. Remember, send in your questions to be featured on a future episode and subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast app.